children four years old to second grade it was Kelly Day today. Kelly Day, the children's four years old to second grade, the children's church. The rest of you, I'm going to ask you to take God's word and find that John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 22. John chapter 3, verse 22. And I want to preach on this subject this morning, the Baptist faith and message. The Baptist faith and message. If you read through our Baptist faith and message, I'm not going to preach the whole Baptist faith and message tonight. Matter of fact, I'm going to, today I'm going to preach a different Baptist faith and message today, all right? But my title of my sermon is The Baptist Faith and Message. John chapter 3, verse 22 through 30. The Southern Baptist Convention was founded in 1845, and Baptists have always had distinctive beliefs from other denominations. Though it wasn't until 1963 that a formulation of those beliefs was set in order and, and written out and officially approved of, uh, Herschel Hobbes spearheaded that, that endeavor uh, to draft up the principles and beliefs along with the scriptural support that the convention approved of and that the churches adhere to. These principles, and from 1963, they were updated. Uh, there was some clarification made in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which the one we, we support, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, where clarity was offered in certain areas. The Baptists do differ in beliefs with other denominations, but there are some fundamental beliefs that are held by all true born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Those are cardinal doctrines of the faith. If you don't believe in those doctrines, you're not saved. Uh, that, that's how important they are. They're fundamental. Uh, to, the, to our faith. As a church body and in, as individual Christians, we must understand that we must be uncompromising in our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith, our hope, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Our faith is built on the Word of God declared by the holy prophets in the Old Testament and by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The Bible is the basis for our belief and our practice as Christians. Around 30 A.D., long before the Southern Baptist Convention came in uh, to be in, there was the first Baptist faith and message. The son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the forerunner of the Messiah, a man full of the Holy Ghost, and a child of God, there came a faith and a message that was clear. We can learn much from John the Baptist's faith and message. John declared the situation for the Baptist faith and message and the specifics of the Baptist faith and message. Believers, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we're to never hesitate to point people to Jesus. We're to never hesitate to bring praise to Jesus and to give glory to Jesus. So I want to challenge uh, people today. I want to challenge God's people to recognize their place in the kingdom in his work, to revere our king as we work, to rejoice in the Lord of the work, and to make much of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what you believe today about Jesus? Do you know what you believe today about salvation, about uh, faith, about grace, about repentance, about the church, uh, and, and other fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith? Are you clearly declaring your faith to others like John the Baptist did? Are you grounded in the faith? And are you giving out the faith to others? We ought to be doing that. And I want to challenge you to do that today. John chapter 3, if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you would, if you would stand with me all over the building one more time. John 3 verse 22 through 30. The Baptist faith and message. The Bible says that after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anan near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had yet not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. You can be seated as we pray together this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you speak through your word to our hearts today. Lord, change us by your power. 
Lord, save those in this place that are not saved today. Lord, let us be grounded in our faith, in the Bible, and what we know, and what we believe, in your word, that we might declare your truth with compassion, and Lord, with clarity. Lord, make us witnesses of you. Give us boldness like John the Baptist had, Lord. And may your people serve you in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before we get into the essence of the message, the specifics of John the Baptist's message, I want you to see, first of all, there was a controversy uh, concerning the converts. In verses 22 through 26, I just read that there. There was a controversy concerning these converts. And he gives, and John, the Apostle John, here gives a comparison of the ministries. He tells us what was going on after these things, after Jesus had met with Nicodemus, after Jesus had explained to Nicodemus the way to get to heaven, after Jesus, after Jesus had told him about God's greatest love and God's greatest gift. And then he challenged Nicodemus, whose side are you on, Nicodemus? And that, we learned that last week. Whose side are you on? After that, John tells us that Jesus left Jerusalem and came to the land of Judea, and there he remained. The King James used the word tarried. There he tarried, or the New American Standard translates that, spending time with. The word means to remain or abide, continue. It, it, the word describes a significant amount of time. Jesus came there, uh, and there he spent time uh, with his disciples. The word gives the idea of spending much time in sharing and in ministry. And let me say parenthetically right now, right off the get-go, that, that we must spend time daily with Jesus, just like His disciples did. Yeah, we have to spend time daily in the presence of Jesus. We must not take time off from following Jesus or being faithful to Jesus. The Apostle John recalls that Jesus came into Judea with His disciples, and there He remained with them, and there He baptized. Now, we, we will learn in chapter 4, verse 2, you can see that Jesus Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were baptizing under his authority. The question would come to mind then, why was Jesus baptizing and why was John still baptizing? Well, the Apostle John tells us that John the Baptist was still engaged in ministry, and he tells us where he was engaged in ministry. He was engaged in Enon, Enon near Salem. It is unknown today, but its likely location is midway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, about three miles east of Shechem, is what scholars tell us. The Apostle John tells us where John was baptizing, in Enon, near Salem, but he also tells us why he was baptizing there, because there was much water, much water emphasized is the resource for the need. Many people were coming and there was a need for much water. That again it emphasizes that John didn't need a puddle and John didn't need a stream, but he needed much water to baptize. They were being baptized by immersion. Even though this wasn't Christian baptized, it was a symbol of their repentance and it was a symbol of them being washed and being clean. To answer this question why John was still baptizing, it was a baptism of repentance. People were coming, confessing their sin. They were, they were showing through the waters of baptism that they had repented. Uh, so in verse 23, the Bible uses those words came and were baptized. Both of those are in the imperfect tense in the Greek language. It tells us they kept coming and John kept baptizing them as they came. It states the comparison here in the ministry of Jesus and John. This baptism was not Christian baptism because Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. Jesus had not been raised from the dead. Jesus had not yet been glorified and the Holy Spirit had not yet been uh, come upon believers. The people were coming to be baptized symbolizing their repentance toward God. Christian baptism, I'm going to explain that to you today. Y'all just got to witness it, so it's a good time for me to preach on it. Good time for me to explain it. Christian baptism is done after salvation, after conversion, after a person becomes a believer. Hence, it's called believer's baptism. And we understand that. Baptism is done by immersion, which pictures the death to self and the death to sin, and it identifies the believer with Jesus Christ who died for us. It also pictures the burial. Uh, uh, as Jesus was buried, they took Him off the cross, and they put Him in the tomb. Uh, and baptism pictures burial. We were buried with Christ through baptism. Then baptism, hallelujah, gloriously pictures the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It identifies the believer as a new creation in Christ Jesus. That They've been buried with baptism, in, in, in baptism with Jesus, and they've been raised to walk in the newness of life. It symbolizes new life in Jesus. 
Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so too believers have experienced new life in Christ. Remember, the Apostle John penned his account that we're studying about 90 A.D. He, he wrote his last of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke wrote theirs before John. John wrote about 90 A.D. And, and so the Synoptic Gospels would have been in circulation for many years. So John gives a summary statement here about these things that were taking place in verse 24, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now that's an obvious fact because if John was in Aden baptizing, he couldn't have been in prison. He wasn't baptizing in prison. But John gave this statement as a point of reference for his readers to know the time frame when these things took place. So he talks about the John, the Apostle John gives a comparison of the ministries. Then, then the Apostle John gives a word about the cleansing in the ministry in verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. John tells us a dispute arose. Can you imagine that? Uh, John the Baptist's disciples and some of these Jews begin to dispute. Dispute, that word means a question, a searching. Uh, for, uh, the act of searching. They began to question. And there was a dispute rose. The Apostle John tells us those who were involved in this dispute and what this dispute was about. It had to do with purification. And it surely arose over the fact that John the Baptist was baptizing. So those Jews didn't like that. They questioned John's authority. And what right does your teacher have baptizing anybody? That baptism symbolized repentance and, and being purified from sin. And so they had a question about purification. Uh, that word means a washing off, a cleansing, a purging. The Jews participated in all sorts of cleansing rituals. They washed pitchers, they washed bowls, they washed cups, they washed hands, they washed their feet. They, there was all kinds of ceremonial washings. Matter of fact, these folks uh, focused more on outward cleansing than they did the heart. God's more concerned about your heart. John's disciples were zealous for the Baptist ministry and they engaged in a dispute with the Jews coming in and questioning. And listen, we must learn to live for Jesus and stand for Jesus and declare the truth of Jesus without being mean, without being vindictive, without being arguing with unbelievers. We just state the facts to them. That don't mean that we don't ever get in a dispute because we got to dispute. If they're disputing the facts, we need to tell them the facts. Amen. <laughs> We're, we're to speak the truth in love and let God use our words and works and done in His name. Only the Lord Jesus can cleanse a person's heart. If you're here today you're not being cleansed of your sins, listen, only Jesus can cleanse your, in your heart. Only Jesus can forgive you of your sins. So the conflict between the message of John and the system of ceremonial religion into which he stepped into was uh, to prepare the way for the Messiah. The response of crowds repenting and seeking forgiveness was evidence of spiritual life without reality. People didn't need a religious system as much as they needed salvation. They longed for an inner purity that could not be provided by ceremonial washings, that could not be provided today by religion. You all right today? I'm telling you, it's only through relationship. And therefore, John was glad to point them to Jesus. And you and I are to be pointing people to Jesus. Our role as Christians and our role as a church is to point people to Jesus. The Apostle John reveals the comparison of the ministries, the cleansing in the ministry. Look in verse 26. There is a complaint about the ministry. Well, I don't know if this was the first complaint. No, it wasn't the first complaint. Moses had a lot, bunch of complainers in the Old Testament. But here's another complaint. John the Baptist had to deal with complaint in ministry. Look in verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. I mean, the controversy concerning these converts moved into high gear. John's disciples came to John and to offer their complaint to John. John's disciples had been observing the people and the ministries of John and Jesus, and they concluded that John's ministry was losing people and that Jesus' ministry was uh, gaining great multitudes. So they came to John. They said, Rabbi. That word means teacher or master, and it's a title of respect and honor. So they respected their teacher, John the Baptist. And they respected John and their word to him showed their loyalty and their allegiance to him. The disciples of John uh, did not even mention the name of Jesus. They said, the, the one that you testified of 
which John was quick to testify of him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's disciples recognized that John had testified of Jesus and gave honor to Jesus, but they were still envious. They were still jealous of what was going on. And by the way, church, we need to be careful that we're not jealous of a sister church or a brother or sister in the Lord of what God's doing in a church or in a Christian's life. We should never complain about God's work if God's doing the work. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today done in the name of God ain't done by God. Are you all right? Because it's not done by the Word of God. It's, the Holy Spirit ain't nowhere near that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, if it's God's work done God's way by God's Word, we ought to rejoice in it. In their eyes, he said, look, John Stop said, Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So in their eyes, uh, there was competition in their camp. And their camp was losing out. John, we're losing people left and right here. I mean, our offerings are going down. People are leaving left and right. What's going on? At, uh, John I wasn't the first pastor to hear about stuff like that. The one that John testified had many converts, and they were use exaggeration here. They said, all are coming to him. Now, not everybody was coming to Jesus because John was still baptizing, obviously. All people, though, need guidance and direction in life. And people need leadership. And we see that John's disciples came to him with a problem. To them, it was a travesty that the people were going away from their master, going away from their teacher. Man, John was a strong preacher. He was, he was preaching about repentance, saying people need to repent. And so they were thinking, man, everybody's leaving and going over here to this new rabbi. William Barclay said this, It would ease life a great deal if more people were prepared to play the subordinate role. So many people look for great things to do. John was not like that. He knew well that God had given him a subordinate task. It would save us a lot of resentment and heartbreak if we realized that there are certain things which are not for us. And if we accepted with all our hearts and did with all our might the work that God has given us to do. God's called each one of us to do. And God had a work for John the Baptist to do. And John completed it. John fulfilled it. Believers must always remember the primary focus of our ministry, of the church work, is Jesus Christ and point people to Jesus. We should not allow ourselves to become prideful of a particular church or a group or a leader with which we are associated. And we must do our best and our utmost to resist any kind of competitive spirit. We're on the same team, serving the same God, working for the same king and, and his kingdom. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> Envious or bitterness, comparisons make us ineffective. Our task is to follow Christ and see that He's exalted. John the Baptist, can I tell you, let me remind you of a few, th few things. He knew what it meant to be isolated. I mean, from birth he had taken, a, he was a Nazarite from birth. He knew what it was to be lonely. He had been a Nazarite from birth and he knew self-denial in the wilderness. John also knew great success as multitudes of the common people, but also of religious leaders, of soldiers, all kinds of people would come out to hear him, and they, they responded to his message, and they were baptized. John had been on the mountaintop, and now he was seeing his popularity go away. It could have been extremely easy for John the Baptist to get right in with his disciples and say, Yeah, you're right, man, I don't know what we're going to do. That Jesus has taken everybody. He can't share, you know. Uh, that's kind of what we, we might have been saying. Uh, that he could have gotten negative and bitter and want recognition and praise. But John's disciples came with a complaint about their ministries. Their, ma their rabbi's ministry was declining, and the one that John testified was rising. And listen, you can't please everybody all the time. Jesus didn't, so you're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Nobody's going to do it. But John would use this controversy to glorify and magnify Jesus. We can learn from John how to diffuse and handle controversies. So we've talked about the controversy concerning the converts. Number two, I want to point out uh, the clarification concerning the Christ. John, the Apostle John, gives a clarification concerning the Christ. Four things and we'll be through. So listen with me. Number, number A in your outline, don't you see in verse 27, the realization of John. He gives clarification concerning the Christ. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So John realized, listen to this church, we ought to get this down. John realized that his call to ministry was by God. That his influence in ministry was by God. And any and everything that he had received for ministry was by God. It would do us well to remember that God is sovereign and it, and, and it is God that calls us, that God equips us, God blesses us, God uses us and gives us what we need to do His work and glorify His name. 
Matt Carter said, the good hand of God is the reason for any success in ministry. Big buildings, growing budgets, and increased attendance don't measure the success of a ministry. The results are not ours, they're God's. And He has the authority to do with us what He desires. Ministry drift happens when we lose that perspective. And ministry becomes focused on our success, our accomplishments, our victories, and our crowds. But it's not about us. It's about God and what He's doing. Ministry is about pointing people to Jesus, not gathering people to us. The Apostle Paul had to address this with the church at Corinth. Because they began to have factions within the church at Corinth. Don't you listen? I put this, you can read it with me on the screen. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. The Bible says there, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did not indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Now, there was factions going on. There was a disputing going on in the church at Corinth. So John, the Baptist, realized that any blessing that comes from God, he realized that what he had accomplished in his ministry was not a work of man, but it was a work of God. God wants our faithfulness in the good times and the bad. God wants us to be faithful uh, through the good times and the sad. He wants us to be faithful in times of success and in times of barrenness. Still be faithful to Jesus. If, if, if God guarantees success to those who really serve Him, is He limited in fulfilling that expectation of success by what we would call success? I think every one of you in here would say that John the Baptist and Jesus had a successful ministry. I believe y'all would say that. You read your Bible. If you didn't say that, you're denying the fact. They both had a successful ministry. But one of them lost his head, and the other one was crucified. So what, what, is our, what we think of as success may not be God's idea of success. God calls us to be faithful where we are. God calls us to be faithful with His plan in our life. God's gifted us to serve Him, and you and I better use those gifts for God's glory. John realized that no man can receive anything unless it had been given to him from heaven. Listen, the measure of success for any ministry is not how many people follow the minister, but how many people follow Christ through the minister. This is a powerful witness of true faith, a faith that doesn't seek any glory. And John proclaimed what he knew. There's the realization of John. Be in your outline. Notice the recognition of John. He says in verse 28, You yourselves bear me witness. John's talking to his disciples. You bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So John turns this complaint into a reminder of his testimony about Jesus. John recognized his calling by God and his communication of the Lord's message. John made his proclamation about the person. He was not the Christ. He didn't deny that. He clearly stated that. Then about his position. He said, I've been, I've been one that's been sent before him. John was not confused about who he was in God or what he was to do for God. I think that's uh, much of the church today. We're just confused about who we are in Christ and what we're to be doing for Christ. We need to look to Jesus. We need to follow Jesus and do what Jesus did. John knew the Messiah and he witnessed for him. John knew his ministry and he worked for him. John knew the message to proclaim and John knew his ministry position. John was sent before the Lord to be the forerunner to, of the Lord. He was called by God. He came on the scene for God. He was faithful to prepare the people for the coming of God. And then when he was finished, he was taken home by God. And if you're, not, if you're here today, y'all here today, amen, I see you. If you're here today and you're here and you're saved, uh, you're still here for a purpose. God's got, got a plan for us to serve him, the glorified Jesus. In, in our lives. And if He's not taking you home, He's not done with you yet. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say. And He's not taking me home yet, so He's not done with me yet. He's not taking you home yet, so He's not done with us yet. Do you recognize your place in the kingdom work? Are you actively serving Jesus where He has called you and the way He's equipped you? John would not allow himself to be recognized, but he recognized the one who's worthy of recognition, Jesus. 
Are you pointing people to Jesus? So there's the realization of John. Secondly, we've learned of the recognition of John. Notice in verse 29, I want to say a word about the rejoicing of John. Look in verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, the joy, this joy of mine is fulfilled. The Apostle John quotes John's assessment of his ministry by using an illustration of a Jewish marriage. John knew his role as a friend of the bridegroom. It was his responsibility to prepare for the wedding and see that the bride is ready for the bridegroom. John was the friend of the bridegroom. He labored for the Lord. He rejoiced in the Lord. So it was his task to hand to ask for the hand of the bride to arrange the preliminaries of the wedding and to oversee the reception of the bride and the bridegroom. He had done that and he rejoiced and his joy was fulfilled. Jesus, John had finished the work that God had called him to do. He rejoiced to hear the voice of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. He, and about, by the way, he rejoiced greatly upon hearing the voice of the Lord. May we learn from John the Baptist. Hey, Baptist, we're Baptists this morning. Most of us are Baptists in here today. Let me ask you this. Let us learn, let us learn from this Baptist, please, uh, that we might find joy, great joy in serving Jesus and doing His will and hearing His voice. The church needs the joy of the Lord in her midst. We need to rejoice greatly in Jesus. So listen for His voice. Obey Him and rejoice in Him. John says there in verse 29, this, Therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled. That word fulfilled, I love that word in the Greek. The word means to make replete. Uh, it means to cram a net, like cramming a net full of fish. Man, you can't get another fish in that net. It's like leveling up a hollow place, putting that dirt in it, packing that dirt in so that hollow place is gone. <laughs> That's what the picture is. It means to finish, to perfect, to make full. And the word's a perfect tense word in the Greek language that means that his joy was fulfilled and it will remain fulfilled. I mean, if we're saved by the grace of God, I don't care if you've been saved one day or 59 years, we ought to have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. Thank God for newborn Christians. I mean, too, too, too many, sadly, too, they get around too many of us older Christians and we rub the joy off of them. We beat the joy out of them. What do you mean getting excited and happy? What do you mean smiling? What do you mean? Well, I'm saved by the grace of God and we ought to have joy in the midst of this church. Amen. Amen. Thank God. And, and John had the joy of the Lord. I'm having a spell up here this morning. There's the rejoicing of John. I want to say a word lastly uh, about the reduction of John. Now John's message, as we talk about his clarity and his Baptist faith and message, John's message clarified baptism. It realized that all blessings come from God. He can't do anything if it wasn't sent from heaven. He also recognized that Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He is Lord. He's come for his bride. Then lastly, notice the reduction of John here. He must increase, but I must decrease. Uh, the Baptist faith and message contains one of the most powerful statements in the fa uh, of faith in the Bible. John is saying, I must decrease. John's declaration of faith in Jesus spotlights his important, the importance of dying to self, of denying self, and living for and magnifying Jesus. John wasn't concerned about the numbers. Matter of fact, he rejoiced because people were going to Jesus. That he was doing his job, pointing them to Jesus. And he was glad. He rejoiced in that. In our faith and in our message, we must make sure about uh, Jesus. And, and we make, must make much about Jesus and little of ourselves. Too often, though, church is about people, about pastors about friends and family, about comfort and cliques, about temperatures and traditions, about and little about Jesus. Can I tell you, we gather because of Him, we scatter because of Him, we worship because of Him, we give because of Him, we pray because of Him, we minister because of Him, we evangelize because of Him, we discipleship because of Him, we fellowship because of Him, we worship because of Him. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Our lives and our ministries and our work, our service is to be all about Jesus. If you own a business, your business ought to be about Jesus. Your workers ought to know you love Jesus, that you stand for Jesus, that you're, that you're compassionate, that you have conviction in the Word of God, though, and that you love them, but you're going to lead them, and, and you're going to make much about Jesus. In your home, uh, Dad and Mom, you ought to know, your kids ought to know much, that you make much about Jesus in your home. 
John states the importance of his reduction and the Lord's rise, of his decrease and the Lord's increase, and his becoming less and the Lord becoming more. The word much there stresses the necessity of Jesus being magnified. Warren Wisby reminds us that three times this word much is used in three significant ways in this chapter. There is the must of the sinner, John 3, 7, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Then in John 3, 14, the must of the Savior, the Son of Man must must be lifted up on the cross. And then lastly, the must of the servant. He must increase and I must decrease. We are never to share the spotlight with the Lord. He alone is worthy of our praise. That word increase in verse 30 means to grow. It means to enlarge. So the Lord Jesus is to be growing in influence in our life, to be growing. If He's in us, Brother Tommy, you've heard that little illustration, a little boy got saved. He said, if Jesus li lives in me, shouldn't He be sticking out everywhere? <laughs> Amen. He in, and we are not quenching. We are not put out the Holy Spirit's fire in our life. And Jesus ought to be sticking out everywhere in our life. He ought to be seen in us and through us. When we're, but when we're on the increase and Jesus is on the decrease, here's what happens. Let me, I wrote a few things down here. When we're on the increase, we become more worldly. We become more ungodly, more sinful, more lustful, more hateful, more spiteful. We become more like the devil when we're on the increase. But when Jesus is on the increase in our life, we'll be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, there'll be love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control in our lives. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in us. When Jesus is increasing in our lives, we'll be faithful to God. We'll be faithful to His Word. We'll spend time in the Word daily. We'll be faithful in His church. We'll be faithful in our witness. We'll be faithful in our work for Jesus, in our worship of Jesus. John declared that the Lord Jesus must increase, and He must decrease. That word decrease means to lessen in rank or in influence. It means to decrease, to make lower. John had the proper faith, and he had the proper perspective about himself and the Lord. He knew that Jesus must increase and that He must decrease. So let me ask you one more time. Is Jesus increasing in your life and in your work, in your service, and in your home? Is Jesus on the increase in your marriage and in your family? Are you on the decrease? Are you dying daily to self? A Presbyterian pastor one time in Melbourne, Australia, introduced J. Hudson Taylor by using great some superlatives like great to introduce the preacher that day. When J. Hudson Taylor came to the pulpit, he said, Dear friends, I am the little servant of, of an illustrious master. <laughs> Amen. That's where we ought to be as well. Thankful to Jesus. When William Carey was dying, he turned to a friend and said, When I am gone, don't talk about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's Savior. I desire that Christ alone might be magnified. That was indeed John's attitude. The Baptist faith and message. What a great message. He said, I, he must increase and I must decrease. So in essence, John was saying, I am the herald and Jesus is the king. Stop following the herald because the king has come. Let me share with you a word before I close this morning. Mark chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Listen to what John, Mark testifies about what John said. The Bible says there, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. I mean, he's, he's the kind of guy, any, anybody would be proud of that kind of pastor. <laughs> And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Lord expects us to have the same attitude that John had. Every day we need to be surrendering to Jesus, to the Lord Jesus, to ask Him to fill us, to ask Him to use us, to ask Him to be glorified through us. We need to know what we believe. Baptist, do you know what you believe? We, we, we must be, uh, by faith, share what we believe. The message of our Lord Jesus. We need to know what we believe and share clearly and compassionately what we believe with the lost and dying world. John shows us how to handle controversy by pointing people to Jesus. I'm going to say a word here before I close. Many Baptists are not familiar with what they believe. I mean, they've grown up in church. They're Baptists because mom and dad was Baptists. They're Baptists because grandma and grandpa was a Baptist. They haven't never taken ownership of their faith. I'm telling you, I'm a Baptist not because my family was a Baptist. I, I, I believe I'm a Christian first and foremost, but I believe we believe right by, by the Word of God. That's why I'm a Baptist. 
I believe we have uh, our doctrines in line with what God says. So, uh, I mean, I don't, uh, but I want to declare the faith. And, and remember, remember this. God doesn't have any grandchildren. <laughs> he only has children. You've got to be born again into the family of God. We must understand the fundamentals of the faith and have conviction to never waver from God's truth. John the Baptist will have the first Baptist faith and message. And I believe, I believe Jesus is calling today Southern Baptist. I believe he's calling Southern Baptist today to be sharing our faith and message with a lost and dying world. I mean, if we don't believe it, you need to go somewhere else. I mean, uh, if you say, I don't believe that, because uh, we are a Bible-believing church. If you don't believe the Bible, you're not going to be comfortable here. I'm just going to tell you, I love you. You ought to feel welcomed here. I shared that with this, the, the uh, Sunday school class. Day. Every person ought to feel welcomed here. When they come, they ought to feel welcomed, but they ought not feel comfortable. Because if the Word of God's preached and the Holy Spirit of God's convicting, they're not going to be comfortable in their sin. When I was lost, I went to church. I wasn't comfortable because the Word of God was preached. And I got under conviction. But when I got saved by the grace of God, man, I, I got happy in Jesus. Are you decreasing? And is Jesus increasing? Have you truly come to faith in Jesus Christ? And are by faith are you following Jesus? Today the invitation is for you to trust Him, to follow Him, to serve Him, and to declare your faith in Him. Let's... As Southern Baptists, let's be faithful to share the gospel with us. So, preacher, I need training with that. Well, that's part of my job. If y'all don't know how to share your faith, I'm failing at doing what I'm supposed to do is equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And they say, preacher, we need training. Okay, good. We'll get together and we'll train you so you can share your faith in Jesus Christ. But we ought to be sharing. We ought to know what we believe and we ought to know why we believe it and we ought to be telling others about it. John the Baptist didn't point people to him. He didn't point people to him, but he pointed people to Jesus. Let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we had today as we talked about baptism. Lord, we got to see baptism in action today. Thank you for Reed and Troy following Jesus and believers' baptism. And Lord, bless their lives, their home, their family. And God, watch over them. Let us encourage them. And Lord, help us to equip them and love them in the faith, Lord. And thank you for uh, that family today. And then, God, as we've learned about baptism and, and all the controversy that goes on in that, even today, still people believe that you got to be baptized to be saved. People believe you got to be baptized this way or that way. But Lord, we need to do it your way, what you say. Help us to declare our faith, Lord. Help us to know what we believe and be witnesses for you. And Lord, in this invitation, I'm going to invite people today to die to themselves. I'm going to invite our people, Lord, today to die to self, to die to sin. Uh, Lord, to be on the decrease so that Jesus might be on the increase in their lives. God, I pray that we, Jesus must increase. May that be our attitude like John the Baptist had today. Lord, if you're dealing with hearts this morning, I pray that folks would come today and surrender and say that to you today. Lord, you must increase and I must decrease. Lord, forgive us when it's been about us, when it's been about what our wants or our, about our ministry or about our work or about our class or about our service. God, help us today to point others to Jesus. Lord, would you do a work in this invitation time. Draw men and women to yourself today. And God, we thank you for letting us respond and help us to respond in faith today. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the building?